My name is Charles Godfrey. I'm director of the Oxford Martin School. And thank you for joining us on an extra web conversation that we're having. Over the last term, we've been having a series of conversations on the topic of what the slogan building back better means after the pandemic. And that series stopped last week. But something else happened last week. And this was a really interesting scientific advance a potential solution of what is known as a protein folding problem. And we had a number of emails which asked us, might we have a talk uh, to explore some of the exciting issues around that? And that is what this talk is today. And I'm joined by two really interesting guests, one who you can see, who's Phil Biggin in front, and one who um, you'll be able to hear, but I'm afraid not see because of a technical issue and that is Yvonne Jones. Yvonne, can I just check that you're there and listening to us? I am, and I'm really sorry, everybody, and sorry, Charles and, and Phil, not to no, no, no. seeing you. The, the, yeah, as Charles said, there's a, something weird has happened to the camera on my laptop, and it just refuses to... Uh, there is a gremlin somewhere. So let me begin just by uh, introducing uh, Yvonne. So uh, Yvonne is Professor of Protein Crystallography at Oxford. She's a fellow of the Royal Society. She co-founded at Oxford with Dave Stewart, the Division of Structural Biology, which is part of the Nuffield Department of Clinical, Me of Clinical Medicine, of which she is co-head at the moment. And Phil, Phil Biggin is Professor of Computational Biochemistry in the Department of Biochemistry, which is part of our Medical Science Division. And rather than me do it, I'm going to ask Phil and Yvonne in about two sentences, just to give us a flavor of the work in their lab at the moment. Yvonne, might you go first? Sure. I'm interested in the receptors that sit on cell surfaces and take in signals in the form of proteins that bind to them. Uh, to allow cells to communicate to each other. I'm particularly interested in signaling between uh, cells involved in the development of our nervous system and uh, also cells involved in our immune system. And I use protein crystallography to solve those structures. But I also bring in lots of other techniques because I'm really interested in the way that the proteins interact with each other, not just in their shape. Thank you, Evan. And Phil. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and my lab is also interested in, in receptors, but uh, we predominantly use uh, molecular dynamics simulation technology to, to look at the, the, the underlying dynamics of these proteins, uh, in, in looking at things like channels and transport of proteins. And although we don't do structure prediction per se, many of the underlying computational methods that they use, we also use as well. Thank you very much both. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to just chat very briefly about what a protein is. And I, I realize that many people listening will be very familiar with it, but we're going to have a brief discussion of that just to bring people up to speed if they don't, don't know about it. And then we'll go on to what exactly this recent advance is and some of the uh, consequences of it. Now, those of you watching live in Crowdcast will see that down near the bottom right hand of your screen, there is a button or a facility called Ask a Question. We do really encourage you to ask a question. There's also the facility to vote questions up. So if, there, if someone else has, has asked a question that you're really interested in seeing answered, then you, you, uh, you're able to, to vote it up. And while it's not exactly a strict democracy. When I come to looking for questions, I'll see the ones which have got have got the uh, uh, most uh, support. So um, let's explore a little bit about the background. And Yvonne, perhaps could I go to you just to remind us about what a protein is and why we're worried or why we're interested in its three-dimensional shape? Okay, so proteins are the, the little machines or the little workers in our cells and then also messengers that go between our cells. Uh, they're encoded uh, by the, um, the genome, by our um, DNA sequences, uh, which uh, are translated into so what have been described as beads on a string. So uh, there are a number of different flavors of amino acids and uh, these form into polypeptide chains uh, so long strings of beads, each of which have rather different properties. Some of them are positively charged or negatively charged or um, sticky sort of oily um, amino acids. 
And according to those properties, the beads on the string will fold up into a complex three-dimensional structure. Uh, I heard Janet Thornton on the um, on the Today programme, actually, when uh, the, this announcement about uh, the protein folding problem um, hit the news uh, a week or so ago. And she described it as, um, yeah, sort of, uh, you start out with a shoelace and you're kind of, yeah, forming the, you're tying it up into the three-dimensional shape. So sort of uh, molecular origami. Absolutely, yes. And why is it interesting the way that it all folds up? Well, because each protein has its own unique shape, its own unique fold. And that fold, that shape that it has in three dimensions, determines its properties, what it can do. I just said that they're, they act like little machines in our cells or little messengers going between cells. So they, they're capable of, um, um, of doing all the tasks that, that, that we need doing. But to do those tasks, they have a very specific shape. And if you don't know, I'm not explaining this very well, if you don't know um, their shape, it's a, it's a bit like not knowing what's underneath the bonnet of a car. You can't work out how they work if you don't know what shape they are. So understanding the three-dimensional shape is really critical. Now, you're a professor of protein crystallography. And might you say how crystallography and X-ray diffraction is used to, to um, construct the three dimension, to determine the three-dimensional shape? Right. Well, the problem is uh, obviously that that proteins are um, are too small to be able to visualize in using light microscopy. Um, so there are a number of orders of magnitude smaller than uh, than you could do with that uh, using using visible light to 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 see their detail. But you can use X rays. Uh, they have a, a wavelength that is. Um, able to you know pick up the, the the fine structure if you but you you can't really just do that by having a a single copy of a protein and hitting it with an x-ray with x-rays you need um many copies of the protein to all lined up rather nicely in a in a crystal structure crystal structure is just a the the the, the crystal is just a, a trick an amplification method so you're able to look at many um, many copies of the protein at once, and that will give you a, a strong enough signal uh, to be able to um, actually solve the structure. Unfortunately, it's a bit it's a bit more tricky than that because you don't actually manage to measure all the information you need just from the the amplitudes of the the diffracted X rays, as we call them. Um, there are some other sort of missing bits of information to do with the timing of the, the phase of the different. Um, diffracted rays coming off. Um, and part of the complexity of the problem is, is why so many Nobel Prizes have gone to X-ray crystallography yeah. over the years. Well, I, guess, I, guess it, I guess maybe initially that, obviously that would be a case because when people like uh, Dorothy Hodgkins uh, working in Oxford, Max Perutz uh, and, and, and John Kendrew working in Cambridge, when they started out, it was a mammoth task. Um, and they had to work out all the methods of how you could how you could even begin to sort out what a, a protein structure would look like of course they had no idea you know what what it was going to look like but uh from the beginning the people have always because it's a difficult thing to do have always chosen to try to do structures that are going to be very enlightening for the biology so um, in the case of Dorothy, she, she worked for many years on insulin because she thought this is going to be an important structure to understand um, because ultimately we want to be able to, to make forms of insulin that will help um, diabetics. Can, um, can all proteins be crystallized? Are there some proteins that you just can't get a structure out of using this approach? Yeah, I mean, for, for many proteins that we have succeeded in, in crystallizing the various tricks and quite a lot of, um, of work over many years to get to persuade them to crystallize and using different techniques to get them to crystallize. But um, there are also some proteins that have just never crystallized. Now then, quite why that might be. One, one whole set of proteins that won't crystallize is, is, are those that are only partially structured and only really become structured when they interact with other proteins. Mm. So that's another whole different different problem. Um, but yeah, that, that we, yeah, it's um, it's a bit of a black art 
persuading them to crystallize. But of course, you know, there are other methods for doing experimentally solving three dimensional um, protein structures. So, so um, I was going to ask you about that, that you hear a lot about cryo EM. Um, might you just explain what that is and what difference that has made to uh, protein uh, structural studies? Mm. So I was saying that uh, X-rays uh, are can 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 allow you to probe the fine the fine detail that the sort of dimensions of um, the distances between atoms that you need to 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 know to to visualize a, a protein structure. Uh, well, um, electrons can allow you to do that as well. So uh, 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 an electron microscope will allow you to solve a protein structure. But for many years that promise of, of being able to solve a protein structure was out of reach. I mean the first hurdle was again that you, you need to be able to look at a to to gather the information from a lot of different copies of the protein. Uh, and uh, each one individually will be damaged very rapidly by being hit by the electrons in electron microscope. So you have to be able to to cryopreserve them, to embed them um, in uh, in vitreous ice in a way that uh, people discovered ways of being able to do that without damaging the protein. But then you need to be able to, to collect huge amounts of data to do so very sensitively. So you need really, really good detector systems. And then you need really, really good computer power to crunch them because some of the 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 tricks that we've been able to use in protein crystallography, the fact that we got a crystal, the computer has to do that for, for the cryo EM. It has to be able to, to add together all the, in, the individual images from many, 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 many copies of, of the individual protein molecules that you've got on your, you know, um, cryo EM yeah. grid. Yeah, so needed really good computers, needed really big advances in detectors, and bingo, you started to be able to do it. And that's opened the door for lots of proteins that were recalcitrant when it came to crystallizing them. So now we can use the two techniques in tandem. It's really powerful and exciting. Thanks a lot, Yvonne. So, so that's the, the, the sort of physical direct way of estimating protein structure. Um, but of course, for most proteins, we have the amino acid sequence. We have the sequence of beads on the string that Yvonne talked about. And we pretty much know the different ways that the molecules interact. So, Phil, you have all this information. Why is it not straightforward just to use a big computer to calculate the three-dimensional structure? Why is there a protein folding problem? Yes, it sounds uh, such a simple question, doesn't it? We've got the sequence. We should be able to just compute the structure. And the best way probably to explain this was, was thought is in a kind of thought exercise that um, is a classic paradox that many people probably have heard of. Um, formulated by um, Cyrus Levinthal in 1969, uh, when he noted that it would take longer than the age of the known universe to enumerate all possible configurations of a typical protein by brute force calculation. So he estimated that something like 10 to the power of 300 possible conformations for a typical protein, uh, and you know, to evaluate each conformation. Um, would, would require even a picosecond of time would mean that actually that would require uh, time way beyond even the age of the of the universe. And just to put that in context, the context, the age of the universe is about 14 billion years, which is about four times 10 to the 17 seconds. So yes, it, that's why it's such a hard problem because you can't solve it by brute force because you'd have to enumerate or calculate all of the energies of these different potential conformations. And even if you had a very fast way of doing that, um, it would just simply be very too, too difficult. We wouldn't have enough compute time. And yet, you know, in nature, proteins fold spontaneously, some within milliseconds. And that dichotomy is referred to as Levinthal's paradox. So if you can't do it by brute force, what approaches have computational biochemists taken over the last 50 years? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I, I would say you could even go back uh, beyond that, actually, you could probably go back to the 50s. The first prediction, if you like, can be attributed to Powling and Corey, who first suggested this notion that there would be alpha helices uh, and sheets. Uh, and and, at the and time, just, to, just to interrupt you there, alpha helices yeah. and sheets are yeah. parts of protein structures that you get in lots of different proteins. There are sort of 
common theme that you get through three yes, they're like a sort of substructure if you like that's probably the way to the, the, the way to think of them yes exactly so yes so so, so alpha helices have this kind of helic, helical kind of conformation and sheets are just kind of extended strand conformations and the 50s was also uh, a time when the first sequence was actually elucidated which I, having just mentioned insulin insulin i think was the first sequence that was elucidated by um, fred sanger and Around this time, um, Anfinson was also doing his quite famous experiments on RNAs and looking at how they would fold. And that's now a very famous experiment that he did in 1961, which concluded with a statement which was basically that the native conformation of a protein is determined entirely by uh, the amino acid sequence in a given environment. The, la the latter part is often left off, but it's actually super important that this given environment um, and then, obviously, that became you know, a thing to predict, try and predict the 3D structure. But I would say um, probably most effort was focused on the smaller task of being able to predict um, the secondary structure. So by that, I mean these alpha helices and sheets. So if you could just work out which bits might adopt these helical bits or strand, strands, that would be a good start. And so a lot of the early work uh, sort of dates back to the work of Chu and Fasman in about 1974. That was the first, uh, I would say, the first real prediction of structure uh, this kind of, of, of the helices and sheets, if you like. And they simply said, well, we'll just use um, the statistical propensities of the amino acid residues to form a specific structural element or secondary structural element. Uh, and they did that, and that was quite successful. And ever since then, people have been trying to extend that. And people have started to employ, for example, neural networks in the late 80s and 90s that was that was first done to uh, secondary structure prediction quite successfully and that's still still ongoing um uh, and then i suppose the next um thing to note that's that's particularly important in the context of, of, of protein structure prediction is the uh, is the establishment of the pdb in 1971 so that's the protein data bank which is a, a, a essentially a database with which is where the the structures that yvonne was talking about um, that you derive from x-ray crystallography are deposited and in such a way that it means that anybody around the planet can actually access them and we're going to be coming on to that when we talk about uh, alpha fold could, could i get you and forgive me phil um yes, just sure. hurrying along to to it could you tell us a little bit about the casp competition yes yeah, so the casp competition was um something that was set up in in, in 1994 um stands for casp stands for the critical assessment of structure prediction uh, set up in 94 people in the field kind of realized that they needed some way of of trying to assess how good these predictions really were uh, and the idea was simply to do this in a, a double blind experiment so a double blind in the sense that you would um, release the sequences of the structure uh, and withhold the, the structure itself back and allow participants to enter they would enter in a blind way, meaning that uh, the people who were going to assess the submissions didn't know who the people uh, making those submissions were. And it was a very successful competition. There were 33 targets at the time, uh, about 35, I think, groups uh, took part in that and made about 100 predictions. Uh, and that, that model has been followed up and it was so successful. It's still going now, obviously, as we, as we know, um, but it was also copied. So there was also something called CAPRI, which is the critical assessment of protein interactions that was set up in 2001. Uh, that's still going as well. There was also something called CAFA, critical assessment of function annotation. And that was set up in 2010, but that stopped in 2014, I think. But I think the community is still active. And another related set of competitions is called SAMPLE, which stands for the statistical assessment of the modeling of proteins and ligands. And the name, as it suggests there, uh, it, the idea of that is to focus more on problems to do with ligands and their interactions with proteins. And that's something that my group personally has become a little bit more involved with in, in the last couple of years. And it's interesting you say that uh, I'm a population biologist and certainly the uh, math mathematical population biologists in my area have looked with great envy at, the, at CASP and the success of it. And we've tried to think whether we could set up something equivalent in our field, but so far have failed. Um, Maybe I'll just headlines. interject because it is. Yvonne. Can I just interject? No, it's just as from the perspective of, a, of an experimentalist. I mean, 
CASP is a, is a, is a fantastic community effort. Uh, the, um, the guys that run CASP go around, get in touch with all the experimentalists in the run up to the competition and ask us if we've got any structures that we haven't yet published. And so it's it, there's a real interplay between the experimental experimentalists community and uh, and the the you know the protein folders um, because that that's where they they're getting they're getting structures that we haven't yet published. I myself haven't it, the timing has never been quite right for me to be able to give them something. But you know these these emails pop into my um, inbox every couple of years. Twenty years ago, when I worked at Imperial College, I remember going to a tremendous party when uh, Mike Sternberg's group there had done very well in the CAS competition of mm -hmm. that year. Yeah. Um, Phil, you, you mentioned um, machine learning and neural nets, and the headlines that we saw right at the beginning of the month was that AI had solved the protein folding problem. Uh, and you've mentioned that um, various forms of machine learning so using a computer typically based on a neural net to scan many different, to learn from many different existing data to try and predict new ones have been used before. Can you tell us a little bit about what is special that the approach that DeepMind and AlphaFold have taken and um, what they have achieved that is new? Yeah, okay. So the first thing I think that just needs to be clarified a little bit here is that they actually haven't solved protein folding per se. It's more correct to say that they've solved the protein structure prediction problem rather than the folding problem, which is a, a bit more complicated actually. And if you even want to be a bit more precise, you could argue they've solved the prediction of crystal structures of proteins. So the question really is, well, how did they do it then? Uh, and the real answer is we don't actually know the precise details <laughs> of how alpha fold works. Because uh, they've been very cagey about what they've been saying in the in the announcements, um, um, but presumably we will learn exactly how that works when uh, you know the paper of papers appear in, in, in due course over the, presumably the next year. Um, we do know, however, a little bit about how their previous entry works. So going back to the previous CAS version, uh, Alpha Fold One, if you want to call it that. Um, that uh, we do we do know roughly how they work because they did release um, a version of the code and so you could look at that and tinker with it uh, and and that kind of works and builds on actually what a lot of other people were doing um, um, which was to employ this concept of multiple sequence um, alignments to to great effect so one of the big developments which I was which I, which I should also mention which was terribly important was the developments in sequencing. Um, because after, around the 2000s and beyond that, um, there, there suddenly appeared this vast amount of data in terms of the sequences that were available. And this actually allowed you to, by doing a, a, a very large multiple sequence alignment, you could actually look at which residues in which positions seem to co-evolve. And the, they would, a residue at this position would change over here, and it looked like it would change to something else over here at roughly the same, in roughly the, in the same sequence. And the idea was by looking at how strongly these co-evolved, you could actually then predict, well, the idea was that they might be close together in space. And you could use that to kind of then create a kind of pairwise distance constraint on the building of the model. And actually that's what a lot of people had done prior to the success of AlphaFold. And it's what AlphaFold did in their first entry to all intents and purposes, uh, all intents and purposes, combined with a little bit of tweaks around the outside as it were. Now, Alpha Fold 1 appears to be a little bit different, uh, and this is the step change, which we, we obviously have to wait to generally find out what the, the, the details of that are. But it appears genuinely end to end in that a sequence goes in one end and out pops, out pops a structure, uh, which, it, which, is, um, which, is, which is incredibly impressive. Um, but what we do, do know is that it appears to for, adopt a kind of much more dynam dynamic learning approach within it uh, to work out kind of as it's going along, which pieces of information um, from the sequences are more important than others. And this depends on a new piece of deep, relatively new piece of deep learning architecture, which I don't really know anything about, but it, it's called a, a 3D equivariant transformer for those who are interested. It was also developed by um, a team in Google in 2017. So it's not surprising that it's been used in AlphaFold 2. 
it's been demonstrated the use of that, that kind of architecture has been used very successfully in language translators. That's probably where um, most people might, if, they, if they're interested, might have come across it before. So that, that was, that's definitely one of the big differences. The other difference is, is that it requires a lot of computational power as well. So they, they do require a lot of resource to do that. Uh, I think they use something like 128 what are called tensor processing units. That's roughly about 200 GPUs, I think, over a few weeks. So they had. So there are some differences. We don't know quite the, the full extent of the, the, the methodology yet, but it's kind of builds on what people have done before. But there is a step change, definitely, and an employment of new art, new deep learning architectures uh, to, to, to make this significant jump, if you like, in the, in the predictive power. Phil, I've heard that in trying to solve protein structures, that the expert human, the you and Yvonne, uh, can sometimes provide insight, that sort of straight um, mathematical brute force fails to provide. And that what might be happening is that the new artificial machine learning is in some ways replicating that biochemical insight that humans had. Now, is there truth in that or is that? Uh... I don't, yeah, I've sort of heard that sort of thing said before as well. And I, I, I'm not sure if that's the correct way to think about it, to be honest. I, I think it's partly because I don't actually know uh, enough of the underlying details uh, of, the, of, the, of the new architectures to, to give you an honest answer about that um uh, so i yeah i'm not sure whether that, that's true or not it's a not a very good answer i know but it, mm. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll, 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 yeah and I'll, I'll come from a point of even more ignorance when it comes <laughs> to the, the, the their approach but um i mean that from what i understand of the the the, the previous approach the the one from two years ago as as phil was saying it's it's this idea that um, you know the yellow bead, uh, sorry, the the blue bead and a red bead from different parts of the of the beads on the string like to actually end up close to each other on the when the when the protein is is actually in its three dimensional shape. Um, and actually, as a yeah, as a as a structural biologist, often if I'm uh, you know find finalizing the structure of a protein I'll, I'll be looking at it and i'll be thinking yeah yeah that makes sense that a an arginine should be should be you know close to a aspartic acid so a a blue and a and a red type beads are close together so it, it, it's a similar thing now that i imagine you could sort of think that that artificial intelligence has learned that because of course it's learned these rules by going through looking at the i, I believe they quoted a uh 170,000 protein structures um, in the protein database that they were able to use to learn from, as well as, of course, all these sequence alignments. But what I also read somewhere that the, the, the latest iteration, the one that's, that, that's provided the breakthrough, is, is not just sort of looking at a pair, pairwise, but something more like building up kind of a jigsaw puzzle and that you, you put together things in you know you put together all the bits that are sort of the tree and the bits that are the river and the bits that are the cow crossing the river and and, and then it sort of clips <laughs> it all back clips it all together you see what i mean and I, I i imagine again that you know there are blocks of 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 areas in proteins that it just then makes sense that they they would come together but i'm yeah who knows it's going to be extremely interesting to see exactly how they did it and a sort of related question is that um Machine learning to a certain extent is a black box. You have inputs in and outputs out, but there's a lot of work in trying to actually reconstruct what is happening within that black box. And do you yeah. think that when that is done with a uh, deep fold that it might say anything about how proteins physically fold in nature? Or do you think it'll be just much more pat pattern matching? So it's getting an answer without it telling you anything about the physical processes involved. My, my, my thing is it, it won't tell you anything about folding, actually. I, I think mm -hmm. it, it, it ultimately is, is, a, is a bit more of just a pattern matching. I don't think you'll get much information about the actually how it folds. This is, this is a data versus physics problem almost in that sense. You know, now we are, 
you know, previously we, we, were, we were kind of thinking that this problem would be solved by just using our crude understanding of elementary physics. Um, but this is this is actually the other thing that's now become prevalent, which is making use of all the all the data that's out there. Uh, and I don't think actually you'll get much. And that's you know good news for academics working on folding per se, because <laughs> they, they probably don't, they, they can probably sit a bit bit bit, bit more comfortable and sleep at night. But um, I don't think they'll get much. There's much to be had from looking at folding for this. Thank you. Uh, Yvonne, when the news came out, I think it's November the 30th and December the 1st, then it sort of made the front page of newspapers um, and was on the on on um, on radio and television. Um, within the field, how much of a surprise was this to you guys? Did you did you know it was coming? Were you surprised by how good the predict, predict, predictions were in the final CASP uh, round? I guess I am actually. I, I suppose, yeah, I would not have predicted that it would be this particular cast. I mean, they, because there have been periods where instead of progress every two years, you know, they, they looked at one stage like the field was stalling and then and then things started happening again. Then there were there were sort of new approaches and big jumps forward. And you could imagine that that artificial intelligence, that, that machine learning was going to, to be able to, to mine these these huge databases now and, and make a big step forward. And a lot of people were trying to do this. But um, I guess when I first woke up, I thought, well, I heard this on the, the day program or whatever. I thought, well, how good is it? And I, again, I've been rummaging around a bit trying to, to find out. And there are some figures some pictures um provided which show very impressive what we call superpositions so they've taken the experimental structure and they've overlapped you know, they've, they've superimposed onto it the, the the model that they had come up with and you know the the two sit virtually identically on top of each other but the caveats to that are that they that they're for individual protein structures so um, they've managed to come up with something that, you know, if, if we were talking about insulin, they would have been able to predict what insulin looks like. And it would look very much as Dorothy Hodgkins had solved it. Um, I don't know how, I, well, again, I saw one picture that, that implied that the actual, the, the, the real details, because the, the beads aren't just little sort of beads. It isn't that all the beads sit up on, on, on top of each other in the correct positions. It's that you've, you've got actually the, the detail of, of what each residue, each, each the side chains of the, of the residues, they're, where they're positioned. Um, they're getting there with that. I, th I think they're probably, the numbers that I've seen quoted are that they're accurate to, you know, within maybe two angstroms overall of, of, of the match in position on average of everything in, in the, um, well, in the, in the main chain, in the fold. Know, but is that going to be good there. enough to do certain things? And I think that's going to be fun to just chat over for a few minutes now. They've done and something... And I'm just going to interrupt there to say an angstrom is about the size of an atom, just to give people... Oh, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I'm obsessing about how accurate it is, is that you need things to be accurate to within less of an angstrom, actually, to be able to to accurate to use structures then to to act, act, accurately design um, drugs that you might want to 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 use to to jam some, you know, to to fit into part of of a protein structure and for example stop it working if for example you want to to block a protein machine that's important for a, for a viral function or something so you need a, a a very high level of accuracy for certain sorts of things um to be a, um, so to I, I i don't know i i, I whether I, I think they are they i think they're going to be able to get there they they have clearly got there for some of the medium-sized proteins it's extremely impressive but the next challenge and they say this themselves in their press release is is to be able to then look at um not just one protein by itself but these complexes of proteins because proteins that don't actually usually wander around by themselves they 
there are gangs of them. They're not very good at socially isolating a protein. So they, they'll clump them together. So, so just to check, I understand you correctly. You, you're impressed by the structures that the, that they are producing at the moment, but you worry that they might not be quite as good um, to show where every atom is. And you need to know where every atom is if you're trying to design a drug, because typically a drug needs to fit in like a, lo a key in a lock. And so you really need high accuracy, which at the moment you you do require a physical means of looking at the structure rather than the computational. I think it's probably a little still, they're still a little bit off from being able to, to be able to help with um, directly with, with the drug design side of things. But um, having said that, there's a lot of protein structures that aren't actually good enough, experimentally determined protein structures that aren't good enough to be able to really guide drug design you need you need only the very best structures are good enough for that so it, it it's a, i'm setting them a very high bar in saying that um and i i think they're it's extremely impressive what they've been able to do and they are clearly able to for many um protein you know sequences predict what that protein is going to look like to sufficient accuracy to to be able to say give an idea of maybe how it works or what it does. Um, but there are still big questions about how it will be able to interact with other proteins. Uh, at the moment, they're not able to predict that. Whilst we can do structures either using cryo-EM or, or X-ray crystallography of, of clusters of proteins and see how they fit together. And it's often in the way that they fit together um, that's important for for their function. Thank it's you. Important for... so, so, Phil, let me go to you as a computational biochemist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is I mean, that your feeling as well about the relative whether? I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I think actually it, it, we, it, it's very it's a very impressive result, whichever way you look at it. I don't think anybody in twenty thirteen in the CAS thirteen would have predicted that. That alpha fold would have done as well as they have done in this um, in this event. Um, it's, it's notable, and the reason there's a lot of hype is it's notable for some, for a lot of, for a few reasons actually. The first is that alpha fold two was not just ahead, but it was more than twice as good as the next best entry, and that was true across nearly all the targets. I think if I'm correct in saying that, and and that that would be impressive enough actually, but. This time, the reason why there's a lot of hype, I think, is actually that for the accuracy um, as measured by something called the global distance uh, score, um, which is which is another metric, which I won't go into, but anything above 90 is considered informally, at least, to be rivaling experimental accuracy. And AlphaFold have claimed a median score of 92.5 across mm -hmm. all the targets. That's why there's a lot of hype. Now, Yvonne's right. If you want to delve down and look at the RMS, the root mean squared deviation, how different it is when you superimpose one of the predictions on the target, then, yeah, about 50% of the time across all atoms, this is, um, you can get un they're, they're under two angstroms, which is what Yvonne was, was mentioning, which mm -hmm. is still pretty impressive, actually. If you make your tolerance a little bit slacker, so less than five angstroms, then 92.5% of the time, they get the right answer, which is, which is quite impressive. And, and I think there's scope for improving that, actually. That's the good news as well. I think, actually, it's not clear whether you could refine that a little bit, maybe with a bit of physics, <laughs> perhaps, to, to improve the, the models. Uh, and, and it's not also clear whether some of that difference reflects some of the crystallization uh, mm -hmm. uh, we could mm -hmm. artifacts or some so th there's a lot of things that one one could probably delve down to a little bit and, and consider that and uh, consider um you know it, it with a bit more detail i think i think the level of accuracy is useful enough even now though that you might even start to question some experimental results you might be thinking oh is it really us or is it the experiment right <laughs> and um mm -hmm. and indeed i i read on somebody's blog and apologies if you're listening and i'm quoting you or misquoting you here, uh, but I did read on someone's blog that actually that's already happened, that one of the experimental groups had seen the results on the AlphaFold, went back and looked at their data 
And indeed, they had actually misassigned uh, a proline residue, I think it was. Um, so yeah, uh, read, yeah. yeah, so so um, yeah, I read I read that blog as well. I thought that was yeah. very good. That, that so really it's, was very good. idea that actually now we're at the level where we're actually using the computational predictions to you know question whether the experiment itself is right. I think is very uh, that's an important step change actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and it, uh, I think going forward, it would probably be better for the predictors to compare to the raw electron density actually rather than. Yeah. The model that the, the crystallographers have generated. So great theoretical ecologist, uh, Bob May, Lord May, who died earlier this year, used to love to quit. My theory completely disproves your data. So I'm sorry it's not <laughs> alive to enjoy this. What I'd like to do is to go to some questions. And the first one I think is uh, for I Yvonne. Um, mm. And this sort of says, has alpha fold, is it likely to facilitate or replace uh, crystallography? And how do you think it will become incorporated into um, the drug design pipeline? Mm. Right. OK, uh, I think for the moment, anyway, it's just going to be incredibly complementary and helpful to protein crystallography and also to, to cryo EM. Uh, but protein crystallography, we, we often benefit from having um, a model um, that we can start from that might not be the exact, isn't the exact structure that we're trying to determine, but it gives us a starting point that allows us to interpret our, uh, our data more rapidly. And um, if we can get those models uh, using AlphaFold, that, that could be incredibly helpful. Uh, it could also, I think, be used to generate structures for individual proteins, which you could then dock together into complexes that we are visualizing using cryo -EM, um, which may actually be at a rather lower resolution, so rather less detail. We might not be able to see quite all of the detail in um, using some of our, our structural techniques, looking at really big complexes, it's often very useful to be able to get really detailed structures of smaller parts of those complexes and then dock them into less detailed experimental structures. And I think that's that could be a very important way forward um, that um, AlphaFold uh, uh, is able to open up for us. In terms Thank of the, the drug design, yeah, I, I kind of touched on that bit, uh, earlier, didn't mm -hmm. I? I? I think it is going to be very exciting in probably the, the, the sh only the short term, actually, that they, they're going to improve. Because I didn't mean to sound too churlish. I think they, it's, it's incredibly exciting what they're doing already. Thanks very much. That, that question was for, from Yi Quan Law, I should have said. Um, I'll go to a question from Larissa Gohl, which uh, I think is for Phil. Um, machine learning is only as good as the data on which it is tra trained. Um, and if there are biases, then that's going to affect it. Are you aware of any such biases biases in the training set? And it, it, if I could expand that, does this mean that you can't take, say, a very novel peptide sequence from a poorly understood virus and, and um, feed it into deep fold if it's seen nothing like that in the past? Yeah, so that, that's a very good point, uh, and, and, and yeah, that, that's very true. Machine learning is traditionally only as good as the data you put in. Uh, uh, and the, the, there's, of course, there is a bias in, in, in some sense, in, in, for example, the PDB, in that those are structures that are readily solvable um, by, by definition almost, because that's why they're in the PDB. So there is a slight bias there. Now, if you'd asked me the question about AlphaFold 1, then, then I would have said yes the, to, to, to Charles's follow-up question. Would, would, it, would it really struggle to predict something that it's never seen before? Uh, but with AlphaFold 2, the, the, it's, the jury's a bit out, I, I think, on this. It, it's not clear how well it would actually do on unrelated things. I, I think that will be the interesting, very interesting to see how it does on on stuff that it clearly has no idea about and ask it to make a prediction on that. I think that will be an interesting test. I don't think anybody 
has a feeling for how badly, if you want, if you're a pessimist, or how well, if you're an optimist, how well it will 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 do in that kind of scenario. But certainly, yeah, uh, machine learning's uh, the the input data or the data set that you have for training for some of these things is super important. And and yeah, you have to be aware all the time of biases. Yeah. Okay, the next question is for Yvonne. And Yvonne, I'm going to ask you to actually explain the question as well as to answer it. Um, <laughs> what, do you, what do we think about whether AlphaFold will be able to solve the structures for G protein coupled receptors, seeing as they're so hard to crystallize? So, might you begin by just saying what a G protein coupled receptor is? Okay, it's, uh, it's a protein that's uh, oh, a family of huge family of protein, huge family of proteins that are embedded in the, uh, the plasma membrane, the, the, the membranes that um, surround our cells. So they are proteins that are involved in um, picking up signals from the outside and, and signaling into the cell. And they are major drug targets. Many of these, these proteins, because they control Oh, um, all, all sorts of signaling in our um, in our brains, for example. So they, they can be they can be targets for you know, antidepressants and such like. They can uh, they, they they control um, the um, you know activities in our in our hearts. And they, they, there are many many um, many of these family members are very important drug targets. And for many, many years, people have worked to get structures, therefore, to understand and to design better drugs against them, to understand the actions of the drugs we've got and to design better ones. Um, but uh, they have proved to be notoriously difficult to crystallize. And indeed, a clutch of Nobel Prizes were awarded um, not that long ago for the very first structures that came out. And the first structures were by protein crystallography, but they, they needed new techniques to, to be used to uh, persuade these things to crystallize. More recently, there's been quite a lot of um, progress being made with uh, using cryo-EM to solve structures of these proteins. And so, yeah. That there are a reasonable number of, of family members now for which structures are known. But as I was saying, there are many, many, many members in this family, many um, you know, hundreds of proteins for which we don't have structures. And so the argument would be that indeed we could use the um, uh, alpha fold to predict these structures. And it could, it, one would hope it would do perhaps better than, than just starting from a known structure and trying to model from that structure. Uh, but I'm, since the devil is in the detail, I don't know. I don't, I, I hope it's going to help us, but um, I don't know how well alpha fold is working at the moment for these highly membrane embedded type proteins. And also the problem with G protein couple receptors, and part of the reason why they've been very problematic to crystallize is that they part of their function involves them being very dynamic. So they they shape change, not huge by a huge amount, but they do shape change a bit. And that's important for the way that they work. And they interact with other protein um, as part of it. They, they, they sort of pass on the signal to other proteins through their shape change. And At the moment, alpha fold doesn't work, doesn't tell you shape changes, and yes. it doesn't help tell you protein protein interactions. And and the you know the deep mind people in their in their blog in their in their press announcement were saying these are the the next other challenges that they're going to have to move on to in the longer term. Phil, you so want anyway, to that's come. a roundabout thing, but there will yeah. be there will be issues for for drug design still yeah. for for uh, G pro the the. GPCRs that are going to be perhaps not easily solved by alpha fold at the moment. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the yeah that is definitely one of the challenges for you know other other membrane proteins like transporters. You know we we know they don't have one unique structure. They actually have at least two, probably more uh, separate structures that must be metastable as part of their part of their function. And um, you know so which one do you predict? You know. So yeah. that, that'll be challenging for AlphaFold too, I think, to predict. 
uh, yeah. the, the different states of transporter proteins or things like GPCRs, which can exist in multiple different conformations. Yeah. I think transporters might be a bit easier because their changes are probably a bit more extreme. So that you, you would think perhaps that that might be a little bit easier than GPCRs, where the movement is, is quite subtle, actually, uh, for most of them, at least, anyway. But uh, isn't this a problem that's perhaps amenable to the next generation of machine learning in this area, that you can, yeah. where you do understand these metastable states, so the states that flip between it, then you can train a AI to try and learn that and hopefully tell you new things? Yeah, I, I think I, th I think you're right. I think you know that is actually that and the problem of uh, ligamorization are actually relatively low hanging fruits now. In the sense that you know they've done the big problem, which is basically predicting the structure of, of mm. you know, give or take. Mm. Uh, uh, and actually, you know, to to extend that in these these other directions, you would kind of think is not so hard as the the first step. You know, these these second and third steps we're talking about now. I would think would be a little bit less difficult, but I don't know. Maybe it's just um, maybe. And just a, a follow up question to that. My friends who work on glycoproteins always say that uh, the amino acid sequence is only the beginning and it's the the things you stick to your protein after you made it that give all the activity. Then uh, how does how does that affect what we're talking about now? Yes, yeah, so what we would call post-translational modifications. And you're right. Yeah. I mean, one of the proteins that I'm really interested in, which is one of the messenger proteins that goes between cells, it isn't just made out of the beads on the string bit. It's, it's also got an extra palmitolate attached to it, which is essential for its, its, its activity. So it's, it's, got a, it's not just entirely made of amino acids. There are other things that are done to proteins that further change add to their shape and add to their properties and and are essential for their function uh and so there's a whole world there that uh, alpha fold isn't exploring um mm. okay we've got a few more questions and so if possible and i realize it mightn't be uh if you can answer them quite briefly um i don't know who would like to pick this one up which is the the highest vote at the moment and we'll need a bit of explanation how long do you expect before AlphaFold is going to be capable of predicting allosteric interactions? So if you could, Phil, do you oh, want to take that one? Yeah. How long before it predicts allosteric interactions? So uh, just to clarify, allosteric interactions, meaning that there would be another part of the protein away from perhaps where the agonist binds or the, the, the main ligand binding site, there's another site called the allosteric site, which would, which would, which would be you know somewhere where something else could bind and do something uh how how far are we away from understanding that i think that's i think that's a particularly challenging sub problem of uh, uh, of when you get down to higher accuracy so you know i said earlier that 50 percent of the the results were under two angstroms rmsd I, I think you'd have to be confident that you were you know much higher than 50 percent before you could begin to hope to to, to, to sort of tackle that particular question. And now, am I right? Sorry, Phil, I interrupted. No, 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 I just said that that would be my view. Yeah. And am I right? The significance of the question is that were you to understand allosteric interactions, that might give you new drug targets because you could then yeah. look at small yeah. molecules that would then. In yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the benefit of looking at allosteric sites in that way would be that you'd be not looking at the same site as the orthosteric ligand uh, and and that would give you more freedom presumably to to design something new that that that, that didn't have the, the you know there wouldn't be so constrained as the orthosteric site the orthosteric site tends to be constrained by all of the evolutionary properties that are designed to make it the main orthosteric site but the allosteric site presumably can be a bit more freer in terms of how it's evolved and that there could be potential for many more different compounds to bind and change the activation or otherwise of your target protein. So there's an interesting question here is what is your understanding of how AlphaFold deals with nonsense sequences, uh, completely fictional sequences? So I guess there are two issues there. If you make up a string of amino acids, will it always assume a fixed three-dimensional structure or um, is it only a subset yeah. of sequences that form a structure? 
we know that it's only a subset because because there are proteins that that our cells make that mm -hmm. um that are that don't assume one fixed structure and that's part of their function actually that they they can you know shape change and and a, a partly according to to what their um what other proteins they're interacting with but also there are regions in them that are just very very flexible and floppy and just stay like beads on a string i mean phil what, what would you what would you say to that yeah no i absolutely I, I think i don't know if that's the intention of the question per se but yeah if you know there are a lot of the, the genome is probably unstructured so you know mm. that, that's a totally different question and and pro probably not relevant but I mean, really. I, I, yeah, I think it does come to can you then turn it the other way around though and start to design uh, structures? Um, yes. So, so run it backwards and say, okay, this is the structure that I want. Can I, um, can I work out what the the sequence would have to be to get that structure? Because that's how you would then design, you know, enzymes to order little machines that would chew up plastic. I think they've been saying a lot in the in the, in the press releases. Uh, um you could that that is something that already david baker has been putting a lot of effort into uh, this is somebody else who's been looking at protein protein folding problem over the year over the years uh, and it, clearly it's a direction that deep fold uh, deep mind and and alpha folder you know with alpha folder we're going to be interested in, in tackling as well so, so that nicely leads on to uh, my last question we've only got three minutes left and I want you to throw us aside your shackles as a, as a very careful scientist and to sort of uh, project yourself 10 years in the future and give us an example of what you think might be a really interesting result, uh, either in fundamental science or in medicine or applied science that will come out of, well, well both what Alpha Fold has done, but the whole tenor and advance of, uh, of protein biochemistry. So I, I, I am asking you to, 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 to uh, unashamedly speculate about if everything went well, what might be a fantastic thing that we're celebrating 10 years from now? Horrible question. So I'll go to Phil first. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very, very gentlemanly. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, uh, well, I think, you know, you, you can, if, if progress is as fast as this, then, you know, one can imagine that you'll have structures for everything. Uh, and in that case, you know, you, structures we ever want or need to have structures for uh, and things like structural systems biology whatever you want to call it will become a reality and that, i think that's quite an important thing because that could actually then bring uni help unify a lot of cellular level stuff all the way down to molecular so we really really will have a very good detailed structural understanding you know right the way from molecules right up to cells genuinely with no gaps in it uh, totally understanding how all these things to start to interact and function together. That That is not an, uh, an unrealistic goal, I don't think, given the progress in the last, you know, two CASPs in that sense. And, and, and what we've, the ideas we've discussed about um, interactions between different proteins, that, that obviously is the next, you know, one of the next big challenges is predicting how all these proteins will interact with each other, both in space and time within a cell. So that, that, that if, if you like, is, 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 is what you could aim for probably within 10 years. That really is exciting. Yvonne? Yeah, and, and, and running from that, uh, carrying on from that, I think what would also be incredibly exciting is, is going to be the ability to, to understand then the effect of um, a variance in, in, in the genome of um, you know, single point mutations. Just one person having one different colored bead in the string of one of their proteins, is uh, AlphaFold going to be able to to help us more rapidly understand the effect of that color change of just one in one bead, affecting the shape of a protein and affecting the way that it then interacts with all the other proteins it needs to to talk to in a cell. Uh, to go back to to, to Phil's um, uh, answer, so will it ultimately help us understand? all the information that's now being gathered um, from um, you know the, the sequencing the, the, the human genome uh, and help us to translate that ultimately into medicines if we can understand better what's going wrong and going wrong maybe because of just one very subtle 
change, uh, will we be able to then come up more easily with with where to intervene therapeutically? Thanks so much indeed. I I'm really sorry, we're going to have to uh, come to an end now. Uh, it has been a real privilege to um, listen to and discuss with two of the leading experts in this field, the exciting uh, result that we had last, uh, last week. Um, and if I'm to, sort of to paraphrase the discussion, um, much of the hype has been justified, but there is some real details that one needs to think about there. Um, just before thanking you, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who has uh, tuned in and also the many questions. And do forgive me when I've not been able to come to your questions. Um, we're now stopping for the holiday break, but do look at the Martin School website. We'll be announcing some more virtual conversations in the new year. And let me finish by thanking both Phil and Yvonne. Yvonne, you've done magnificently, given that you've had to do this completely blind, whereas Phil and I can sort of see each other's movements. So I'm sorry we had those technical uh, well, I'm very sorry as well. Sorry to be a woman of mystery, but it's been <laughs> lovely hearing the two of you, your voices, and it's been great fun. And it's a, it is a very exciting time. Thank you very much. So thank Phil and Yvonne very much indeed for taking part. And goodbye, everyone.